It's my pleasure to introduce you to Craig Sexton. He's the Global Creative Director of DuPont Sustainable Solutions, an award-winning producer, director, and writer with a diverse 30-year background in film, television, and the entertainment industry. I'm going to let Craig share more of his amazing background, but I can tell you that you, if you've not had the pleasure of hearing him speak before, you're in for a real treat. And yesterday he was doing his presentation while we were setting up, and he seems like a pretty good guy. <laughs> he seems like a guy like, like me. You know? He seems pretty hip. But actually, I'm not hip, I'm an innovator, so that's different. So Craig's a powerhouse, uh, creative powerhouse, is charged with bringing his talent to bear on refining the look and feel of tr learning, training in the learning and development space at DuPont. His recent work has created breakthroughs in instructor-led training with his method of affecting learning and communicating by design. So please welcome Craig Sexton. Thank you, Mike. No running. No running in the house. I have to tell you, I've got to get me one of those orange shirts before I get out of here. I'm telling you, it is so slimming on you, Mike. I, I'm just saying. I'm just, just saying. I have to get one of those. Well, I think the first thing I should do is say, welcome to the Vancouver Island Safety Conference. And uh, I will have to admit, I did try to get them to change the name of the event this year to Sexton in the City. Uh, the uh, steering committee wasn't having any of that, though, although it does turn out that uh, Mike was kind of on the fence. It turns out he's a huge Sarah Jessica Parker fan, um, so HBO probably wouldn't have had a good time with that. But I did get a call from Gerard, and he said, would you be interested in coming to Vancouver Island? And I said, yes, I'm in. He goes, now, hold on a second. You don't even know what I want you to do. I said, it doesn't matter. You know, I'll show up to the opening of an envelope, you know, much less come to an island. And so, you know, when you say island to me, I'm thinking flip-flops, suntan lotion, drinks served in a carved coconut shell with little umbrellas. Little did I know that I would be packing long johns and rain gear to get here. Uh, but I am delighted to be in Nanaimo. I love this place. Nanaimo, I love this place. So hard to say that word. Uh, but anyway, regardless of how it's pronounced, the people here are amazing. And I've had such a good time uh, ever since I've arrived. It's such a beautiful, beautiful place to be. I hope this won't be the last time I get to be here in Nanaimo. Got it that time. Anyway, I really, uh, I've spoken all over the world this year. I mean, literally all over the world from South Africa to South America. Uh, the, um, uh, in Southeast Asia, I've been everywhere speaking to different groups of people. And uh, you know, lots of people when I speak uh, in small groups or in large groups like this are avid note takers. And if you are one of those, you know, please, you know, you're welcome to do that. But I think more importantly today, I'd like you to sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation and have a good time. You're going to learn a little bit about me today. I'm going to learn a little bit about you. Uh, hopefully, if I do my job well today, some light bulbs will go off and you'll have a good time. We'll laugh and uh, it'll start some really interesting conversations. So uh, I am really so excited to be here today to share with you what we have found. New research is showing that the heart controls the brain much more than we had previously believed. Now, I didn't learn these lessons in medical school. I know that comes as a shock to you that I'm not a doctor, but I'm not. But these lessons are grounded in science, and the discoveries can have a profound impact on the way you share your message and lead others to safety. My name is Craig Sexton, and I am the Global Creative Director at DuPont Sustainable Solutions, and I have spent the past 30 years in the entertainment industry, in television and films, and broadcast messaging. And many people have said that the success in my career is the result of being at the right place at the right time a couple of times. Well, when in actuality, they're wrong. I've been at the right place at the right time a lot of times. 
And one of those times was early in my career when I found myself underqualified and overly enthusiastic, and I raised my hand to become the partner and co-founder of BPS Studios, one of LA's very first music video production companies. There was one small problem, though. There was no place to show these music videos. But there were two small fledgling networks called HBO and Showtime, and they were showing movies back to back, and they didn't know what to do in between the movies. So, well, I saw a need, and I set out to fill that need, and I went about the business of trying to get them to show music videos in between their movies. I don't know if you remember those days. And while I did have a little bit of success at that, shortly thereafter, Time Warner announced the launch of a 24-hour music network called MTV. Right place at the right time. And the rest is sort of history. Our phone began to ring off the hook, and during that time is really where I learned how to make abstract ideas concrete, which is kind of the art of making a music video. Now, I'm sure everyone out here has had the experience of hearing a song, and while it means something to you, it means something entirely different to you. There is no better example of this than Louie Louie. I mean, to this day, I still have no idea what that song means. I don't know that anybody else does either. But once you actually see a music video, that abstract idea from that song becomes concrete in your head. And it's actually very hard to shake that visual image and that song apart from each other. And so this is a skill that ha is something that has stuck with me over the years. And from there, my company began to produce and direct. And I directed for such acts as David Lee Roth and Van Halen, Linda Ronstadt, and even Michael Jackson during the Michael Jackson Victory Tour. Working with Michael was really an amazing time in my life. And that rock and roll show at the time was the most expensive show to ever go out on the road. It cost more than a million dollars a week to keep us out on the road. And most of that money was spent on my personal hair care product, but don't bust me on that. It was a mind blowing experience to be out there. And we were even on the cover of Time Magazine. But all good things must come to an end, and my body was beginning to wear thin from being out on the road for so long. And just about then, I got a phone call from a small filmmaker outside of San Francisco. I don't know, you guys might have heard of him. His name is George Lucas. It was a call that I actually didn't accept. I hung up on George, not once, but twice, because I was sure that it was my friends pranking me. And eventually, I did take the phone call, and George asked me if I would be interested in coming to work at Lucasfilms. Well, George, let me think about that. Uh, yes, of course. And uh, I immediately called my partner, and I gave my two weeks' notice. And I left the next morning for San Francisco. And, you know, two weeks, one day, it's kind of the same. Needless to say, I was really excited to get there. And, I started working with George, and one day, as luck or fate would have it, I was on an airplane headed from Los Angeles to San Rafael with George and the COO of Lucasfilms. And this is back in the day when the first two seats in the airplane and the bulkhead faced the back of the plane and the next row faced the front of the plane. Remember those, right? Showing my age here a little bit. But it was a great place to sit if you wanted to have a conversation. Anyway, I was sitting in the bulkhead and I was listening to them talk. Now, I was a young kid at the time, and I was just trying to absorb every word that they were saying, and I was trying to memorize every word that George said. And Well, it's no mystery that George is not a fan of Hollywood. I mean, there's a reason that he built his studio, Skywalker Ranch, in San Rafael. And he said he began to share how he wished he didn't have to spend so much time in Los Angeles anymore. And, well, he thought that we should find somebody to run an LA division of Lucasfilm. So I'm just sitting there and I'm listening to George and the COO talk and I just couldn't believe my ears and my adrenaline began to rush and I just blurted out from nowhere, I'll do that. And George turned and he looked at me and he looked at the COO and he said, see, Craig will do that. And the COO turned and looked at me and said, can you do that? And I said, yes, I can do that. I have no idea how to do that. And then the next day, I began running the LA division of Lucasfilms. 
known as the Droid Works. It was a technology division, and I became the liaison between Hollywood and Lucasfilms. Not a bad business card to be holding in your pocket. And it was there during that time, during the Star Wars trilogies, that I learned the art of storytelling from George and how to create compelling images. It was a remarkable, remarkable season for me, but the Star Wars trilogies began to wrap up. And as things began to come to somewhat of a close, I received another phone call, and this time it was from a company known as New World Entertainment. And New World was being bought by three gentlemen, and they were buying it from a man named Roger Corman. Now, I don't know if you know who Roger Corman is, but he's known as the king of B-movies. Have you ever heard of the attack of the killer tomatoes? Right, that's Roger, right? So, well, these three guys were going to turn this B-movie studio into a mini-major studio. And, well, I have to confess, their passion was contagious, and I got swept up in it, and I accepted the offer, and I accepted the job, and I'll never forget going to my work on my first day, so excited, I bust in the door, and I walk in, and it's just me and a secretary. There's two of us. And that first year, we managed to release one motion picture, and it was called Children of the Corn. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Children of the Corn. It's sort of a horror cult classic. Some of you might remember that film. Anybody remember that? Wow, everybody that actually saw that film is in this room today. <laughs> As, I don't know what's going up on up here up in Vancouver Island, but my mother thanks each and every one of you. Man, that's the biggest response I've ever received. Holy cow, I, can't, I didn't even realize that many people actually saw that movie. But anyway, things went really, really well at New World. And we actually did become known as a mini-major in the industry. And eventually, I was promoted to senior vice president. And in my last year at New World, we released 29 motion pictures. And I had five television series on the air. Some of those shows you might recognize. I developed a show called The Wonder Years, and a show called Crime Story, and Tour of Duty. It was a fantastic time, and I loved, loved the work that I did there. And apparently I wasn't the only one because New World became the object of a hostile takeover. One of those things that happens on the top floor of some corporate building, and someone called me and said, hey, they're going to split up the company. It's going to be taken over. They're going to sell off all the parts. You're going to be one of those parts. And if you ever were going to get out, now is the time. And well, I took that as really good advice, started planning an exit strategy, and I jumped out on my own with a friend of mine. And we formed a new company, a niche business, if you will, that was directed at the networks for doing broadcast promotions and launching television shows. And, well, we were two pretty creative guys, I have to tell you, but we had really small pocketbooks. But luckily for us, the networks had plenty of money, and we had a tremendous amount of success there. I had the pleasure of producing and directing for NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox. I've even had the privilege to create one of the most successful campaigns in television in broadcast history. It's called Must See TV. Now, when I created Must See TV. It was sort of funny. I mean, I actually even heard that this morning when I was leaving my room. Uh, I didn't even realize at the time it would be so successful. At the time, I just thought it was going to be a fall campaign, but it's become part of the vocabulary of North America. I heard somebody say on this morning uh, after a CNN break that uh, they said it was a must see event. It is just amazing to see what powerful messaging can do. It was so exciting that I went on to direct the launch campaign for Fox Sports Network, the CW Network, the UPN Network, and I even launched Skecher Shoes. And it has become my life's work. And I am continually striving to create compelling images and tell emotional stories. So, as you can see from my background and the highlights of my career, I am the perfect person to be talking to you about safety today. <laughs> All right. So 
my background is not in safety, but my background is in moving people and connecting with people and taking people from here to there. My work has been about creating powerful messaging. It's about storytelling. I've spent a career finding ways to connect with people on an emotional level. And that does bring relevance to why I'm standing here talking to you today. Because if you're going to move the needle in safety performance in your organization and lead others to safety, you are going to have to learn how to do the same thing. For the next 40 minutes, we're going to take a look at the key elements that you can take with you today to help lead your organization and effectively connect your message with your workforce. Welcome to Leading to Safety. It's all about the heart. All right, the jacket's off, the plaid's out, it is so on. The idea is to write it so that people hear it and it slides through the brain and goes straight to the heart. Maya Angelou said that and she is one wise woman. And if you don't believe her, maybe you will listen to Mahatma Gandhi. The culture of the mind must be subservient to the heart. And just to take my point way over the top, here's Vincent van Gogh. I put my heart and my soul into my work and I have lost my mind in the process. Even Vincent knew it was all about the heart. And if you're still not so sure, don't worry, you're not alone. From Plato's charioteers controlling the horses, the horses of passion and desire, to Freud's instinctual id suppressed by the ego, there has been a long tradition of seeing the heart and the brain as being in opposition to one another. But the truth, the truth is quite different. I'd like to tell you a story. Antonio Damasio is one of the premier neuroscientists in the world. He's a professor of neurobiology at the University of Southern California, and today I'd like to tell you a story about a patient of his. His name is Elliot. Elliot was an intelligent, pleasant, 30-something guy who had built a pretty good life for himself. And he had a loving family and a good job and plenty of money in the bank, but his life started to fall apart when Elliot began to have debilitating headaches. The doctors soon discovered that Elliot had a brain tumor the size of a small orange compressed against his frontal lobe. And well, the good news is Elliot had surgery and it was a success and they were able to remove that tumor. However, even after the operation, Elliot's life continued to go downhill. His relationships unraveled. He couldn't hold a job, he lost all of his savings. Now, Elliot's IQ stayed the same, testing in the smartest 3%. But after the surgery, something was still wrong with Elliot's brain. It turns out that the damage to the part of his frontal lobe somehow resulted in his inability to feel emotion. Now, you might think that this would be beneficial, right, for at least his work ventures. I mean, think about this, right? Without his heart getting in the way, he would be able and have the ability to make calculating, rational, and optimal decisions, right? I mean, basically, he would become a real-life Mr. Spock. But in actuality, the opposite was true. After losing his emotions, he became paralyzed by indecision. Normal life became impossible for Elliot. Routine tasks that should take 10 minutes took hours. Elliot endlessly deliberated over irrelevant details, whether to use a blue pen or a black pen or what radio station to listen to or where he should park his car. To Damasio, this was an unexpected discovery. You see, at the time, neuroscience assumed that human emotions are simply irrational. So a person without emotions, a heartless person, if you will, 
should therefore be able to make better decisions, right? But to Damasio and other neuroscientists, Elliot's behavior suggested that emotions were actually a critical part of decision-making. Cut off from our feelings and emotions, even the most basic decisions become impossible. It turns out that a brain that can't feel can't make up its mind. Now, we're not the first to discover this. Did you know that the Egyptians thought the heart was so important to life that they thought it was the center of the personality? To them, the heart was even more important than the brain. And they, they were onto something. You see, your heart is so much more than a vessel for romance. It has been described as the king and the mind as the king's advisor. And when faced with a decision, the king may ask his advisors for advice. He may even send his advisors out into the world to gather information, but it is ultimately the king that makes the final decision. And even though his advisors do not always agree with the king, the king is inevitably right. Because the king's view not only sees the bigger picture, he's also aware of the needs, the needs of others. Now, let's take a trip down memory lane together, okay? Your memory, not my memory, it's a scary, scary place in there, trust me. I want you to go back in time, if you will, for a moment. And I want you to try to remember when you were forced to make a life-changing decision, okay? Maybe this is about accepting a job offer, or getting into or out of a relationship, or maybe it's even about moving to a different city. Can you remember a decision like that? A nod would be good here, yes. Okay, hold on to that. And I want to take a quick poll. Okay, informal, but a quick poll. When you're making a big decision, do you listen to your heart more than your head? Or do you listen to your head more than your heart? So let's see what you think. Who here listens to their heart more than their head? A, raise your hand. Wow, okay. Okay, who here listens to their head more than their heart? Raise your hand. Wow, that's fascinating. Seems like most of you are all heart. Well, the truth of the matter is that when you have a big decision to make, you probably use a combination of both, your heart and your head. Now, hold on. Before you start rolling your eyes at me for stating the obvious, I want to point out something that often happens subconsciously. When you reach a crossroads in your life, any time that you have a big decision to make, an internal tug of war begins between your mind and your heart. And we start analyzing our options while simultaneously noticing how these options actually make us feel. And when we ask for advice on our decisions, what do most people tell us? Anybody? Follow your heart. There you go. Or Craig, listen to your heart. And if we listen to our hearts, however irrational or illogical they may seem, they are usually right. And we are generally much happier as a result. Now, not always, of course, but the point here is the heart is critical when it comes to the way that we process information. Scientists have been investigating this for some time now. And there's enormous amount of research that has been conducted over the past 25 years in affective psychology and neuroscience. The study of how people perceive, interpret, and respond to the world around them. And neuroscience has built a strong body of evidence to demonstrate the undeniable link between reason, emotion, and decision making. They have found out that it is indeed all about the heart. Now, let's just see how much you know about the heart. I want to take some more polls here real quick. How many times does your heart beat in a day? Is it A, 25,000, B, 50,000, C, 75,000 times in a day, or D, 100,000 times in a day? What do you think? Do you think it's A, raise your hand if you think it's 25,000? Nobody. 50,000, B, raise your hand. 
There's a couple. C, 75,000. That's a reasonable number for a lot of you. D, 100,000 times a day. Wow, look at that. Some of you are right on the money. The answer is D, 100,000 times a day. That is some serious pumping going on. Our hearts are busy. Let's take another poll. Who has the faster heartbeat? Is it A, men, or is it B, women? What do you think? Raise your hand if you think it's A, men. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think it's B, women. Well, it's interesting. Well, here's the answer. The average heart rate of a man is 70 beats a minute. The average heart rate of a woman, 78 beats a minute, proving once again that women are often working much harder than men. All right, I know that's tough to take, guys, but it's the hard, cold facts. Let's take one more, just for fun. This is the one I love. So, on which holiday are you most likely to have a heart attack? Is it A, Christmas? Is it B, Valentine's Day, the heart day? Is it C, Independence Day? Or the party day, New Year's Eve? Or is it E, the day your taxes are due? Now, I guess that the day your taxes are due isn't really a holiday, but I just tossed it in there anyway. Hmm, so that's a tough one, right? Not so easy here. Who thinks it's A, Christmas? Raise your hand. All right, that's uh, pretty, not a bad percentage of the room. B, Valentine's Day, the heart day, when those guys can't decide what the heck am I going to get, right? Is it C, Independence Day? Raise your hand. A lot of people are scared of fireworks. Not a single soul, right? Or is it D, New Year's Eve, the rockin' party day? There you go. Or who thinks it's E, the day your taxes are due? I know I've nearly had several heart attacks on tax day. Well, the answer is A, Christmas. Studies have shown that there is an increased heart attacks on Christmas Day, whether you know it or not. Doctors suggest that people often delay getting treatment due to the holidays. They don't want to disrupt family functions. And there are other factors that play into this, like emotional stress and overindulgence play a big role. So this year, I advise you please take it easy on the eggnog. And okay, so here are some more interesting heart facts I'd like to share with you. It turns out that there are 40,000 sensory neurons relaying information from the heart to the brain. Think about that, 40,000 sensory neurons relaying information from the heart to the brain, leading researchers to call the heart the little brain and pioneer a new field of science called neurocardiology. Mind-blowing, right? We have found that neurons in the heart enable the heart to learn, remember, and make decisions independent of the brain. That is mind-blowing. In fact, they've discovered that there is more information being sent from the heart to the brain on a daily basis than from the brain to the heart. Did you know that your heart emits an electromagnetic field that can change according to its emotions? And that electromagnetic field can be measured three feet away from your body? I mean, that brings totally new meaning to the phrase, can you feel me, right? And while this might not be a surprise to many of you, researchers have found that negative emotions can throw your system, your nervous system, into chaos, while positive emotions can have physiological benefits, boost your immune system, increase creativity, and aid in problem solving. Research in these domains has resulted in the adoption of new safety practices within DuPont and the integration of these new concepts and strategies designed to move organizations beyond plateaued performance levels. A growing body of evidence suggests that we are far, far more irrational than we previously believed. And we are driven primarily by our past experiences and our feelings associated with them. It turns out that feelings and emotions often provide the basis for human reason. Now, most of your employees' decisions and actions are affective in nature, meaning that feelings and emotions play a critical part. Now, we're talking about the heart here, not the head. 
the heart, not the head. Shouldn't this be a consideration on how we interact with each other and how you connect your message with your workforce? You see, if you want to move the needle in safety performance, instruction alone isn't going to get it done. You need to change how they feel or you won't be effective. We can't just convey data. We need to reach our people on an emotional level and inspire them. We need to start thinking effectively. Effective is the heart. Effective is the head. Effect leads to a decision, and effect is the result of a decision. Now, when I'm crafting a story or creating a powerful message, or at least I hope it's a powerful message, you might think that I am looking for a desired effect. But when in actuality, what I'm looking for is to achieve a desired effect. I need to reach people at an emotional level, and I need to change how they feel. I've been doing this to you for years. This is what advertisers and storytellers do. And if there was a more effective way to reach people, clearly advertisers, Madison Avenue, who has the resources, the money, the manpower, the time, they would be doing it. Can't we learn from them? I'd like to show you some examples of effective messaging. Here, take a look. Sometimes the little things last the longest. Give extra, get extra. Anyone here have a daughter or a granddaughter? Yeah, me too. I have two daughters. And does that get you right here where it gets me? Come on, guys. How many of you even thought it was possible to create such a powerful message without a single spoken word that affected you on an emotional level? This was designed to move you at an emotional level. These advertisers know that emotions motivate. Emotions motivate us to action. Nike motivated us with just three words, just do it. And here's a company that's done it with only two words, think different. These days, Apple's messages are fantastic. And I mean, I am a total Apple fanboy. I want to buy all their products I already have. If it's got an I in front of it, I've probably got it. But it's because their messages are very effective, and in turn, they become effective. So what about, what about one word? Can you think of a company that delivers their message with just one single word? IBM, right? Think. Well. We were able to come up with one other company that delivered their message with only one single word. Here, take a look. Here. Daddy. <sighs> Dad.
Wow, I see a lot of lip biting going on out there. Come on, loggers. I know you're tough, but that gets to you, right? I mean, this is an amazing effective message, and it is aimed at your hearts. Now, I love Dove Men's Care. This ad has worked on me. I used it this morning, and if you don't believe me, you can smell me later when this is over. I smell fantastic. Okay, here's one more. Well, you only need the light when it's burning low. Only miss the sun when it starts to snow. Only know you love her when you let her go. Only know you've been high when you're feeling low. Only hate the road when you're missing home. Only know you love her when you let her go. And you let her go. Wow, I know, I know. My daughter loves this commercial, right? I mean, it is one of Drew's favorite commercials. And if she starts drinking at an early age, I'm going to call Anheuser-Busch and have a word with him. But this is what the most successful companies are doing to communicate their message and change behaviors. Right? This is what your workers are seeing when they go home. Where is the carbonation level? Where are the hops and barleys? Where is the data and the statistics? They're selling puppy dogs and Clydesdales to get you to change your buying behaviors as it relates to products. Is it Miller or is it Budweiser? Are they using data and hops and barley? No, they are using Clydesdales and puppy dogs because what do they know that you don't? go after their hearts to get to their heads and we'll open their pocketbooks and make them reach for a different product. We will change their behaviors as it relates to spending. How are you changing your behaviors and your workforce's behaviors as it relates to safety? The same principles apply. What advertisers realize is that emotions play a critical, critical role in our decision making. See, we would like to believe that decisions are based on the gathering of information and the analyzing of data, such as training and safety methods and the logical way that we process that information. But neuroscience tells us something entirely different, that we make our decisions based on feelings and emotions. Now, how many of us out here, be honest, use statistics, Charts and graphs and data to communicate our information to our workforce. Raise your hand. Right? Me too. This is a good way to demonstrate facts. And it is a necessary component to communicating information. But while it is factual alone, it is not enough to persuade others. You see, we hear data, but we feel emotions. Look at this picture, you can't see what I'm seeing, but there's not one of you in that audience that didn't grin when that picture came up. Aw, His, the history, the history of our lives evoke memories and emotions. And these memories and emotions form the basis of our decisions. Now, a great example of this is buying a car. Now, when you go car shopping, do you just look at the numbers, the data, the gas mileage, the horsepower, and the torque? No, of course not. Now, while all of this data is important, when we go to buy a car, we make our decision based on how it makes us feel. What does it feel like to drive that car? That's what I base mine on. Really, that's not true at all. I base mine on how do I look in that car? How does that color make me feel? Can I see myself driving that car? I can. I want to be that guy sitting beside her. Interesting side note here. Do you know that research has shown that red is the most popular color for men in cars? They have no idea what that means. I just thought I would share it with you. 
Well, and just on another note, any idea what is the most popular color for women in cars? Anybody? Who said silver? Silver. You're right. Exactly. Silver is the most popular color for women when buying a car, and that is exactly why I am not dyeing my hair anytime soon. Okay, so back to my point. What about you? What about you? What about the way that you connect with your workforce? Are you just putting data on a page? Are you taking their emotions into consideration? Are you reaching out to their hearts? Policies and procedures and rules and regulations are not only important, they are essential to running a productive, efficient, and safe organization. But if they were enough, we would not need to be in this room today because paper is cheap. We would simply print more rules, more regulations, more policies, and more procedures, and that would make us safe, right? Wrong. We need to give our employees a reason to follow the policies and procedures. We need to give our workforce a reason to use the rules and regulations. Now, who here said they had a daughter or a granddaughter right here in front? Anybody right here in front? Right, what about you? How old is your daughter, uh, the beautiful young woman right there? Nine, and what is her name? Bryn, what about you, granddaughter? Shelby, how old? 31. Uh, and well, I'm going to use Bryn. So Bryn is nine, did you say? Yep. So what if I could guarantee you tonight 100% that you would get to see Bryn, but you had to wear your PPE on the job site today? Would you do it? It's a no-brainer, right? All over the world I've asked that question. Nobody's answered it differently. It's a no-brainer. If you would wear your PPE tonight, I would guarantee you that you could get to see your daughter. Would you wear it? Absolutely you would. What we need to do is tie safety to emotions in our family. We need to give them a reason so they can make safety personal and make safety a personal choice. And when we reach their emotions, we will change their behaviors. Because it's not about the rules and regulations, it's about the emotions that they associate with those. We need to reach our workforce on an emotional level, so how do we do this? How do we connect with the hearts of our workforce? Well, how do we convey messages so they have an emotional impact? We need to start communicating by design. Our messages need to be more understandable, more engaging, more memorable, more persuasive, and with that, they will become more viral. And that means people are more likely to accept our information, our training, and share it with others. Now, there are two key points in making this happen. First, we need to know our audience, and we have to speak their language. You have to talk to loggers differently than you talk to longshoremen differently than you talk to railroaders. And second, we need to make the audience feel the message with a great story or a dynamic video or graphic and grab their attention and reach their hearts and touch their hearts. Then, then they will be open and listen to what we have to say. It is not the data. It is the meaning behind the data we are trying to communicate now. At DuPont, when I work with my teams all over the world, that is the top number one single and only priority. I tell them all, it is not the data. It is the meaning behind the data that we are trying to communicate. And when we do that, we create images that are compelling and images that stick. And the good news is, the good news is, is there some science and methodology behind how I do this and how others do this? To create compelling images, messages that last, you need the data. Now at DuPont, we are the kings of data. We've got more data than we know what to do with. We have mounds and mounds of data. 
What I tell my people is reach inside of that data because inside of that data lives a story. There is a narrative hiding in that data. Look inside that data, that data, pull out the narrative. And finally, when we find the image or the design that supports that narrative, where these three intersect with each other, well, that's when you hit the impact zone. And that's what you are going for every time. The data, the narrative, the design, or the image. And where those three intersect is the impact zone. You will create a message that then becomes sticky. A message that's hard to shake. Now, Distracted Driving Rewind is an offering that we have at DuPont, an instructor-led offering. It was developed, and it has been used by companies all over the world. Today, I'm going to use this to illustrate the point of sticky messaging. So here's the data behind this offering. If you see it there in the background, there's pages and pages and pages of data about distracted driving rewind about distracted driving. And what that data basically tells us, the narrative that it pulls out basically says this, when you're involved in a mobile distraction, texting or calling, your eyes are off the road for approximately five seconds. If you're driving 55 miles an hour, one second equals 20 yards, five seconds equals 100 yards, how long does it take you to text, do the math, it's a football field. Now, I would venture to say if I brought all of you back here next month, and I will, I will, and we got in this room and I said, recite that to me. How many of you think you could? There's one guy down here, and I would challenge him on that. There's one over there, I would challenge you on that. I would say zero, because it's tough to recite data back. Now, you could memorize it maybe, but let me just show you this. It is not until you combine this data with this narrative and combine it with this image that something magical happens. A little strip of green grass and a football bleacher in the background. Now the graphic says this. When you're driving involved in a mobile distraction, one second equals 20 yards, five seconds equals 100 yards. How long does it take you to text? And you will say a, a football field. Believe it or not, you will never be able to shake this out of your head. If I come back here in a month and ask you how long does it take you to text, you will say it is impossible to break that data and that image apart. Forever, you will now know that when you're involved in a mobile distraction, texting or phone calling, your eyes are off the road for a... Tonight, when you are leaving here, and you plop your phone in the cup holder, as we all do, and you hear it go, ping, and you're going to lean over and reach down, and right as you do, you will think, you will not be able to shake that, thanks to me. Hopefully, you will not text again. How many people in the audience are willing to drive the length of the football field with your eyes closed tonight on the highway? Raise your hands. How many of you will drive the length of a football field tonight with your eyes off the road? Don't. Nobody would get in the car and close their eyes and drive the distance of a football field. This is how we reach our target, target audience, with strong communication and branding campaigns that affects mindsets and human behavior. And when we can reach our people effectively, we get the results that we're looking for. Here are some companies that I am working with right now to create effective messaging. Currently, I'm working with Norfolk Southern on a communications and branding campaign called I Am Coming Home. This campaign is an employee engagement platform centered around safety. And here's an example of an effective message that launched this initiative. Safety has always been the cornerstone of Norfolk South. And that's a thing that we've always said, we're gonna do safety first, we're gonna put it first, it's our top priority. To us, it's all about getting home safely at the end of the day. I'm genuinely excited about sharing this message. It is the cornerstone of what we believe. I've been with Norfolk Southern 40 years this coming June. I've been at Norfolk Southern for 37 years. 29 years. 35 years. 30 years. Worked for Norfolk Southern for 44 years. And one of the really great things 
about Norfolk Southern is people work as a team. And not only do they work as a team, but in so many ways they work together almost like they're family. We spend so much time with one another. It is a family. Families take care of each other. Families look out for each other. Over the years, I've developed such a relationship with so many people that it makes safety personal to you. And we're trying to uh, look out after each other. And safety is the most important thing to all of us. Safety is at the core of what we do. I'm really excited about sharing this message because it reaches our core and that's what we're dedicated to do. It's about our employees, the folks we work with every day. This is about owning our actions and caring. It's not about the numbers, it's about the people. My job is to make sure that the 7,000 people that work for me, they get home. That's, that's my job. But at the end of the day, it's all about safety. Unless we're working safely, the rest of it just really isn't worth it. We've been searching for that one word that sums up safety at Norfolk Southern. A word that really reminds us of how important safety is and how important we are to each other. This really brings it home, makes it personal. I am excited about this whole process. I think it will take us to the next level. I have never been more proud to stand in front of this message. There's nothing more important than this. The challenges facing your company may be the same as Norfolk Southern. Things like a large number of people retiring and a generational changeover. A distributed workforce where supervisors aren't always present. That's why I am coming home is so important. It's employee facing. It's a message by their employees for their employees. So often I see organizations all around the world make the same mistake in safety, where their messaging is targeting in the wrong direction. They write great messages and then they realize it's facing the general public, it's not facing my employees. This message is designed to help Norfolk Southern connect with their people and remind them why they want to be working safe because they have family, friends, and loved ones waiting for them to get home. And they want to be able to say at the end of the day, I am coming home. This is part of a larger communications campaign that I have been working to develop with them over the past two years. It includes everything from print media to phone apps to live presentations and short films. Some amazing short films we have made for these guys. But here is one that I just finished making and created for CN Rail right here in Canada. Take a look at this powerful, powerful, effective message. Hi, we're from CN. There's been an accident. Can we come in and sit down? when we showed that to the executives at CN Rail. 
CN Rail's campaign is centered around the phrase, looking out for each other. And at the end of this video, we ask, who are you looking out for? CN Rail understands that to reach its workforce, it has to aim for the heart. And General Motors has gotten on board as well. I've been working with General Motors for the past three years. My team and I have been working with them on a communications and branding campaign behind the tagline, It's Personal, Own It. Here are some of the ways that we have been communicating with GM's employees. And I mean, these are just a few of the ways. We've done 3D animations about fatalities and accidents and near misses, sentinel events. This was for their 2016 or 2016 Global Safety Week campaign delivered to 200,000 employees worldwide, translated in 17 languages, and GM knows what it's about. The poster says, it's personal to me. While the little girl waits for her dad to get home, or her mom. The other poster was a reaction to somebody who said to me, well, Craig, geez, you know, not everybody has a family, right? Not everybody has a wife or a daughter or somebody waiting for them at home. And I said, oh, no problem, I got that one. So I hired a dog. Everybody's got a dog waiting in the window, and if not a dog, it's a cat. And if it's not a cat, next year I'll have a goldfish bowl up there. But somebody has somebody waiting for them to get home. The other part of the campaign drove on your safety, my safety, we own it, meaning that safety is personal and is not until you make safety personal. People will not own it. Hear me when I tell you that. People will not own personal safety until you make it personal. Sounds kind of logical, right? What's so difficult about this concept for us to get? Why do we keep piling on the same methodology that we've been using for 30 years? We know this in the safety business. DuPont has been in it for 200 years. We know for a fact that we have made major improvements in safety by regulation. In fact, we believed at one time that we could regulate our way to safety excellence, and I know you have too. But what we have all found in other organizations all across the globe, everyone that I speak to is dealing with the same thing. At some point in your organization's maturity and transformation, you plateau because safety regulation and regulating your way to safety will take you this far and you level out, you plateau. How do you get past that plateau? I am giving you the key to unlock that today. I've been doing this for years. I know it works. We have also been working with Irving Oil to communicate data effectively. I am so, so proud of what I'm about to show you. Irving Oil had some very, very sensitive data they needed to communicate. Not all of it positive. How many of you have that same problem? That the things you need to talk about aren't always positive. It's tough to bring up those difficult conversations. Look how we handled it. You know they say every life tells a story. My dad's life would be a love story, because he loves me, he loves mom, and he loves his job at Irving Oil. Actually, there's lots of great moms and dads who work at Irving Oil. But sometimes I worry. Did you know in 2015 there were 49 losses of containment? 11 safe operating limit excursions? I don't even know what that word means. 113 demands on safety systems, 65 failed inspections or tests, and even I know it's never good to fail a test. And 58 near miss process safety incidents. If just one of those had kept my dad from coming home, I don't even want to think about that. 
What about you? Is someone you love waiting for you? Because at Irving Oil, people matter. You matter. And my dad matters. I can't wait for him to get home. I love that. When that little girl says, I don't even know what that word means, it gets me every time. What an incredible way to communicate tough data and statistics without one graphic on the screen. We are attaching, not by mistake, data and statistics through your door number at your home, the address that lives on top of your door frame. Pretty clever way to tie safety to your doorstep. Again, this is messaging filled with data and it is directed at the heart. You can see how research, the power of this science, is benefiting all the clients that we are currently working with. We are meeting and reaching their employees at an emotional level and to change their behaviors as it relates to safety. We are going through their hearts to get to their heads. We are applying this technology now to all of DuPont's products. Here's one example called the Risk Factor. The Risk Factor is an all-new instructor-led workshop designed to help you and your employees understand why we take risk and how to choose safer behaviors. This is about the science of how feelings and emotions play a critical part in our decision making. And I can tell you that this is powerful stuff. I have seen this training and I have seen the impact that it has had on multiple organizations in many different industries. I have witnessed firsthand. In fact, I am a risk factor coach. And I have seen the effects that it's having not only on the job site, but at people's homes. Here, take a look. Even though I had never mentally practiced for this exact scenario, I had spent my life studying major aviation events, and I could set clear priorities, and I knew what I had to do. Then I thought about the risks. What if I rushed and something went wrong? Was being on time to a safety meeting worth risking my own safety? I mean, if I pull over every time I got a call, I would lose half my day just sitting at the side of the road. And is that worth the risk of me losing time? fantastic now I know the idea of bringing the heart into the workplace might seem as a weak or soft approach I mean traditional leadership theory would assure us that the best workers are the brainiest and the most analytical 
machines, if you will, just going through their day. But science is showing us that organizations can thrive when they embrace the fact that both feelings and emotions play an enormous role in driving human behavior. And you know, I have to tell you, after 30 years in the entertainment industry, it's exciting to hear about these scientific findings regarding the heart and its relationship with the brain and our behavior. The science is now confirming what I and others have known in Hollywood for years. It's our emotions that determine what motivate us and what we care about. Without our feelings and emotions, well, we'd be like Elliot, paralyzed by indecision. If you desire to lead others and move your organization and workforce, you have to realize that. The heart is the primary driver of optimal human performance. And if you want to create real and lasting change in your workforce, reach out to their hearts. Demonstrate to your employees that you are authentic, that they are authentically valued. Provide them with opportunities to grow and contribute at a higher level. Appreciate their work and make them feel they matter. And when you communicate with them, do it effectively and by design. Do all of these things and more, knowing that it is rarely an appeal to our brains that inspire us to greatness. It's all about the heart. Thank you.